going to start with Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Paul is writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, and 20, and he's dealing with a, a false doctrine that had come up that Christ had not actually risen from the dead. And that is so important. This is what he writes. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have all men most miserable, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Because Christ is risen, we have hope of eternal life. We're going to sing about that this morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. What a wonderful song. What a great way to open up our service. I want to welcome all of you to Walnut Creek Baptist Church, those watching online and those here in person as well. And God is so good. Let's open in a word of prayer, can we? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for the privilege that you give us to meet corporately in person this morning here at Walnut Creek Baptist Church. We also thank you for those who are watching online, that you would bless, guide, and direct their lives as well. Let us celebrate the risen Savior. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Lord, thank you for this time we have together. Guide and direct as only you can. In Christ's name I pray, amen. This morning we're going to be talking about the subject of truth and what a great song we're going to sing next, My Hope is Jesus. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My hope is not based on my own efforts or merits, but on the finished work of Christ and the fact that I called on Him and He has saved me. My hope is Jesus.
Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. hope that that's your prayer, that your hope is in Christ as well. I'd like my good friend, Brother Paul Deku, to make his way up to the pulpit. And Paul is, uh, we're the sending missionary, Paul and Martha. Martha's here today. You'll have a chance to meet her maybe after the end of the service. And uh, she is, they came home from the mission field because she has been uh, diagnosed with cancer and is presently going through radiation. And uh, maybe, Paul, you can give us an update on that and pray for the offering as well. Come on over, Paul. And then uh, we appreciate the Dekus and their sons. They've been longtime friends, and uh, we've, we, uh, we want to encourage them as well. And God is so good. Just a couple of brief notes. We will have our C groups next week. If you're not a part of one, you can see my wife or anybody at the Welcome Center uh, out there, out in the foyer. And we'll be starting that back next Sunday night. And uh, the Lord is so good. We have a lot going on in our church, and we thank the Lord for it. I do want to make a statement about our race. Uh, we have been running the 15K race for a number of period of times. We host it. We have about 600 people here, Is it maybe up to 600 runners could be a thousand people on the property uh, we received the requirements from the county board of health to do it and uh, it just can't happen we're not going to do that and it's not insurable at all in fact what they're asking to do you can't insure that it's a liability nightmare so we will not be doing the race this year we would like to have done it uh, in may and then we thought about september so we're kicking it now to 2022 and uh, we just don't want to be a hindrance to the community and uh, what they're asking us to do for food. And they pretty much, when we host the race, I will say this, and I don't want to belabor it because a lot of you are involved in this. When we host that race, it's a community event. It's a church event. It's an event where we reach our community and to take away the, the food tent, to take away the water stations, you have self-serve water stations, to take away a lot of what we do as a church to evangelize, to reach people, there's no reason to do it. And, and so I want to let you know that uh, we made that decision a while back, but we haven't really made it public. But we will not be hosting the race this year or in the fall. We'll see how 2022 goes. That seems like such a long time away, doesn't it? But uh, we'll see where the Lord takes us. Brother Paul, why don't you pray for the orphan, give an update of where Martha is on her treatments. And we're glad to have you here visiting this morning. And then you can pray for the offering. Gentlemen, come forward, if you would, for the offering. And we do appreciate your faithfulness in giving, being a tither by conviction, uh, whether you give on the app, online, or in the offering plate. Uh, we appreciate all of that. And we'll be giving an update on some building improvements. And if you give to our building fund or anything like that it goes to our family life center which we're looking to construct construct or partial of in the next hopefully in the next year or so all right paul would you uh give us an update and then you can pray for the offering God bless you. okay thank you pastor and it's good to be here today and i'm glad that my wife could be with us last time i was here she wasn't able to be here so we praise the lord for all the power of prayer that's been helping her um, through this time and she has three more treatments, and then we have to wait a while uh, till we have the surgery. So just continue to pray, and uh, we'll just keep continuing to trust God. Thank you for helping us as the airfares coming back from the mission field. Our son Joshua and Francis, his wife and two children, are doing a great job over there. Um, it's kind of like, you know, uh, how do I take Dad's place? Well, he takes Dad's place with the Lord's help. And uh, so we just appreciate that, and uh, just keep praying. And uh, we're trusting God for all the answers. And uh, we pray that he'll be glorified through it all. Someone said, what do you do when you're in Pittsburgh every day waiting uh, for your wife? And I said, well, I'm a missionary to Pittsburgh now. And uh, God's been giving me a lot of opportunities uh, to tell people about Christ and that we don't have to live in fear. We can live in trusting God for every moment, for every day, and uh, that uh, people need help. And uh, people need Jesus before it's too late. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we just bow our heads and our hearts towards you. We thank you that uh, you are God and that you're a faithful God and we can lean on you. Lord, so many people just have nothing to lean on. But we thank you for all eternity that we have an everlasting God that loves us and a God that takes care of us and that he always makes a way by faith. And as we trust you, Lord, bless this offering. Help it to be used, Lord, every dollar of it in a way that pleases you. And just help the pastor today, Lord, that he'll just preach the word of God and the power of God. And uh, Lord, thank you again for my wife and thank you for what you're doing for her. Bless the other people that are here in this church. 
that need our prayers, that you'll just lift them up and uh, be the great physician that they need. And give us all, Lord, what we need. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to ask you to join us in singing The Father Looks on Me. We'll allow you to remain seated as they're taking up the offering. Luke 15 and verse 20 uh, the Word of God says, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. In Luke 15, Christ gives three parables, the parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. And in each of them, he's talking to us about how the Lord seeks after those who are lost. And this gives the concluding part of the parable of the prodigal son, how the father was already looking for the son when he finally returned home. I'm thankful that the Lord was looking for, for me. The Word of God says we love him because he loved us first. And I'm grateful for that. The Father looks on me. Notice that third verse as we get to it. As it gives some information and it parallels the parable of the prodigal son. Thank you. if you would please and take your Bibles out and we're going to turn to the Gospel of John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8 and we'll be looking at verses 31 through 38. John 8 31 to 38. Pastor is bringing a message this morning titled the truth shall make you free. John 8, beginning in verse 31. The Word of God says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered Him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my Father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your Father. The Lord will add his blessing to our reading of his word this morning. We're going to conclude our singing with holy, holy, holy. Psalm 150 and verse 6 says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord.
Thank you. You may be seated. Our pastor is coming now with this morning's message. If you have your Bibles, we're in the gospel according to John. I appreciate all the singing. I was at a church recently in California last Sunday, and they were not allowed to sing, if you can believe that. How can you tell people? They're allowed to have church, believe it or not, but they're not allowed to sing. And uh, However, it was really interesting because there's so many young people out there that work remotely. Their music team and the entire group was in Hawaii, so they were broadcasting the music from Hawaii. We're sitting in California, and I'm up at 6.30 in the morning watching the service here. So go figure that out, you know, with modern technology. But I appreciate you singing locally, and I appreciate those watching online as well. And the Lord is so good. We're in John chapter number 8. John chapter 8. We're in a portion of Scripture that maybe many of you are familiar with. And we look at verse number 32. is a verse that... Um, is sometimes quoted, I think, frankly, out of context, but we will walk through that. And we hear, we see the word as Jesus speaks to them, and of course you really need verses 31 and 33 to kind of get the gist of it, but I believe it can stand on its own as well. And Jesus says that, that ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Freedom. Freedom in Christ. Freedom in knowing that your sins are forgiven. Freedom and being able to understand which, what the Word of God says. And there's joy in freedom. There's excitement in freedom. It reminds me, several years ago, I was working at a prison facility as a consultant where we were doing the air conditioning for a very large prison, one of the largest in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It was the Philadelphia Industrial Connection Center. And while I was there, we had different groups going into prison surveying, and we were having to rip out all the air conditioning, and I won't get into all the technical details. But on my lunch break, I'd often sit outside the, I would say the church, outside the prison, and I would watch. There was a certain gate, and the gate was probably about maybe half the width of this auditorium. And in that gate, they would periodically, they had a staging system where when you get out of prison, you go through stage one and then stage two, then stage three. I know most of you are very familiar with that process, but for those of you who don't know, that's how it works. So you go through the system here, and there's a stage stage. And, but one thing I saw as I would eat my lunch, my bag lunch that my wonderful wife made for me as I'm sitting in the car, and one of the things I saw that almost inevitably happened, and in fact, I didn't see it not happen, is when people got out of prison, there was joy, and there was freedom. And many times, not only did they get out of the prison, there would be a family there, and they would give big bear hugs, and you know, you can go through should they get out, and I'm not getting into all that, but they were free. There was a difference. There was something in their life that brought joy. And I look at that, and looking at what Christ is saying with freedom, with freedom. So I'd like to preach a message I've simply titled this morning, The Truth shall make you free. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. I ask that you guide and direct, fill me with the Spirit. Bless these dear people. Bless those that are watching. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to me first before anything comes out of my mouth. Lord, I need you. The church needs you. Our fellowship needs you. Lord, help us to be free in Christ. And it's your name I pray. Amen. You know, we see this text. It's interesting. And I believe when he talks about freedom, you have the ability, the freedom, through the sovereign grace of God, to discern God's word and to accept its premise. Freedom. There's a, a joy in that, as I've said. Several years ago at our home church in New Jersey, there was a fellow there, his name was George Walker. He was a missionary to Papua New Guinea. And he and him and his wife, uh, they, were, they had accepted Christ early in their years. They were as green as cucumbers. I mean, that means they really didn't know a lot. They were just, they were just wanted to serve the Lord. So they went to the mission field and they said that the particular mission board they were with put them in the middle 
of the jungle with a group of people that did not even have a written language and they had to develop the language with the group there from New Tribes. And they went through the whole situation and I won't get into all of it, but George gives the, gives the, gives the uh, illustration of how he, they had to develop the language, they had to get it written down, they had to explain to them and they decided because this, pe this group of people did not have any knowledge of the Bible and no understanding at all um, and, and were very primitive uh, and just like Fiji, I think former Fiji, some had been cannibals in the earlier years. They were, they, they were just uh, not understanding of anything that the Western culture brought in. So they decided what they would do is they would act out the Bible starting in Genesis all the way through uh, the gospel being presented. And as they did that, they, would, they had filmed of it. We saw parts of it. There's actually a, a movie called Etow where they actually show that. And in parts of it, they would show that. And, 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 and as George explained, and again, he was out of our church in New Jersey, as he would explain, he said that they started to get it. They got that they were sinners. And we went through the whole thing of sin through the Old Testament, you know, the unfolding drama of redemption, as we call it. They went through that, and they knew they were sinners. In fact, some of them even said, you know, I, I know we're sinners because I've seen what man does to man. And there's that, as Romans chapter 1 says, there's an understanding of a God, right? And so they went through all of that, and they came to the, what we would call the conclusion of the gospel when Jesus was presented as the Messiah, as the substitute to forgive them of their sins. It was phenomenal. And, and the videotape, if you ever watch it, it was their, their faces. And this, you can't make this up. You can't sit here. This was not a program thing. It was done on those big cameras. You remember from the 80s that now we have the cell phones, but they had the big camera on the shoulder and they're, they're filming it. And it started to light them up. And one person stood up, I can be forgiven. And the next one stood up. And we know they were Baptists because they were really excited about it and giving high fives, right? So they were going and says, wow, Etow, Etow was the name of the, the video. And they wandered around and, they, and they, they got it. There was freedom in Christ. And then the, the, the really convicting thing that George said when he presented this, he said, but the real convicting thing was, they said, how long have you known about this message? The man upriver is what they call the white man that lives up the river. And he says, 2,000 years. Why are we just now hearing it? I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version, okay? He didn't quite say it that way. But they got freedom. And they understood what freedom was. And they saw that there's freedom in Christ. And really what Christ is saying here is something interesting. Let's, look, let's kind of look at the verses here just for a moment. In verse number 30, we understand that this, this is being spoken to those that believed on Him. There was a group of people in the previous section that I spoke on last time. The Pharisees and maybe some Sadducees sprinkled in, but there was a, a group of people, now listen to me, that were negative, that were against Jesus, but in the midst of it all, verse number 30 stands out like a crown jewel, it says, but in spite of all the negative naysaying, God-hating, legalistic, do it my way. Look at verse 30. Don't miss this. It says, many believed on him. Don't miss that. And then we pick up today as we go through an expository nature, looking at this, he says in verse number 31, he says, those which believed on him, he makes a statement. And that's what this message is about. If you continue... Abide in my word. Then you are dis my disciples indeed. Indeed is a great word. The, the King James uses indeed. Other translations say for sure. But I think the word indeed is a great. You are my disciples indeed. You're one of us. And in verse 32 and he says, And you shall know the truth. No, gnosko, have an understanding. It's a revealing from a sovereign grace of God. You shall know the truth, and it will make you free. In verse 33, and they answered him, says, We've Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? They didn't get it, did they? So as we look at this text, we see that the big idea here in this text is 
Freedom, excuse me, truth brings freedom. Evaluate yourself right now. Are you free? Most people that aren't free, don't miss this. Do not miss this. Most people that aren't free do not realize they're not free. Evaluate yourself. Freedom only comes from understanding who you are and who God is. It's based upon the truth of God's Word. Truth. Boy, hasn't that been lost? We live in society that struggles with truth. At one time, journalists who would investigate, they would report the facts. Now sometimes you report the facts, you're banned off certain places, and I don't want to get into that. But that's happened. Just a little side note, we were told by YouTube that there was inappropriate content in one of my messages. But in YouTube's defense, they never took us down. But sometimes facts get in the way of how I feel. Does you know that? By the way, please don't cut this message out right now. I'm not going to beg you, but, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, that's all. But we have three platforms, so we're ready. We, we're, we're, we're already loaded for, we're not the only source you can get to us. I don't want to get into that. I'm trying to stay focused. But we live in, a, we live in a, an area, even in Christianity, and in some bubbles of Christianity, we live in an area where truth is, is based upon, we live in a bubble, we have confirmation bias. In other words, we only want to hear what we believe, excuse me, what we feel is right, and that's all we're going to hear. We live in an echo chamber of what we want to hear, and, and that's all we're going to do. We have a, a, a platform that most of you are aware of. It's called Facebook. Have I heard of that? They have algorithms that only give you your news feed on what you like or what you believe. They'll never show you anything that goes counter to what you believe. Let me give you an example how that happens, and I'll tie it in to the Pharisees today because this really turns out well. Let's say you like the color yellow. Anybody like the color yellow here? Okay, so you like the color yellow. So you have a Facebook post, and you talk about yellow. You like yellow things. Guess what is going to be on your news feed from now on? Anything that likes yellow. If you don't like yellow, it's not going to be there. Because you like yellow, and it's going to confirm what you believe, and that's all you're ever going to see. You'll never see the other side of the subject that doesn't like yellow. I'm trying to be nice and very generic with this, okay? And we're not careful, those of you who've never accepted Christ, those of you who are here and watching that maybe this Christianity thing is just something that it's okay for you. You know what? I'm going to tell you to look at truth. To look at truth. This is the exact condition. Confirmation bias. Algorithmic. Understanding of everything. We just want to hear what we want to hear. And that's what got the Pharisees in trouble. Because they said. We are Abraham's son. We were never in bondage. Oh really? That doesn't line up with the truth. And just for a little side note, yes, they were in bondage. In fact, the nation of Israel was in bondage most of the whole time that they existed. They were taken out of Egypt. They were taken by the Babylonians. They were taken by the Assyrians. And just a little mind side note, when this was being written, they were in bondage to the Romans. Don't bother me with facts. I know what I feel. So the Pharisees were saying that. It goes on and on. And I find that interesting in John chapter 18. Look what Pilate is dealing with the very same thing. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? Isn't that interesting? What's truth? He's struggling with Jesus. Should I? I really don't want to convict him. I'll wash my hands of him. Just because you wash your hands of him doesn't mean that you're not guilty. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said unto them, I find no fault in him at all. But yet he convicted him and had him crucified. He did exactly what was expedient for himself, resulting in being guilty of sentencing Jesus to death. Washing his hands in water could not remove his own responsibility for Jesus' crucifixion. Truth! Ladies and gentlemen, where do we get truth? Right here. This is the Word of God. Anything that's elevated to be equal with this is heresy. 
See, we think about truth. We believe that it to be true that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary through the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe that's true. We believe it's true that He lived a sinless life. We believe it's true that He willingly died on the cross as a substitute payment for the sins of man. We believe it's true that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day and 40 days later ascended to heaven where He makes intercession for us at, at God's Father's right hand. We believe it's true that those who place their faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ are forgiven of their sins and can live for Him in the present. We can live for Him now. We believe it's true that Jesus is preparing a place for His followers and will return one day in the future to receive them to Himself. We believe it's true that Jesus is exactly who He claimed to be. He was God Himself in the human flesh. We believe that each of these facts to be true. All those are true. But, you must understand, and you will, please understand that you will act upon what you believe to perceive, believe or perceive to be true, regardless whether it's true or not. Ladies and gentlemen, we've seen examples of this. And I'll dive into the expository nature of this in a moment. Let me give you an example that affected me as a child. Not totally directed, my mom did not buy into this, but how many of you... Uh, remember in the 60s a psychologist named Dr. Spock. Anybody remember Dr. Spock? Okay. We're all dating. We're, this, we have a rare young church, all right? If I asked how many were born in 18, 1980 or later, I think most of you would stand up. But anyway, Dr. Spock told parents to stop punishing their kids for wrongdoing and negotiate with them, et cetera, et cetera. That's what he said. And people took that for truth. Now, this bears into what we're talking about the Bible. I'm not going on a, a rabbit trail here. In fact, I don't preach that way if you understand that. Right before his death in the 90s, he said this. Quote, I'm giving a quote, because I know most of you will Google this to see if it's true. He said, quote, Dr. Spock, we have reared a generation of brats. That's a little caustic, right? Parents aren't firm enough with their children for fear of losing their love and incurring their resentment. This is a cruel deprivation of what we professionals have imposed on mothers and fathers. Of course we did it with the best intentions. We didn't realize it, was, we didn't realize it until it was too late how our, our know-it-all attitudes undermine the self-assurance of parenting in America. End quote. It was true, but no, it's not. And what we find here in this text, what is truth? Truth comes from the Word of God. The setting was is that they had had the, the, uh, the, temp, the uh, Feast of the Booths, the Tabernacles was there, and there was a, an argument in John chapter 8 about who Jesus was, and it, it seems like the Pharisees and those that were uh, against Jesus made a lot of noise. Let me say something. Truth produces disciples. Let's walk through this quickly. Look what it says. Truth produces disciples. Then Jesus said unto those Jews which believed on him, if you continue, abide, remain a part of, you don't leave in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. Now there's a lot in that text. But he's saying part of the definition of your disciple is continuing abiding in his word. And then he goes on and says, And ye shall know, understanding, the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How do you know that? 